Hi everyone and welcome to this uh, special one day charity risk awareness event um, dedicated to um, collecting and donating support for the victims of the war in Ukraine. Um, this, this session is live and there are nine more sessions after uh, after this one so please use this opportunity to ask questions and you can ask questions below the video on the actual conference website which is charity.riskawarenessweek.com uh, or you can ask questions in linkedin or youtube on the risk academy uh, risk academy channel where this session is also broadcasted and all the other sessions will be broadcasted as well. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, now, quick answer uh, to some of the most common questions uh, that people keep sending me. Um, this is a one day special event um, dedicated to collecting money for charity for the victims of the war in Ukraine. The full Risk Awareness Week will happen in October like it does every single year for the last three years. So now let's just check the connections. Uh, please, uh, uh, if you can hear me, if you can see me, uh, please write in the comments, say hello, say where you're watching from. Um, put a plus if you've already donated now here's the uh, um, qr code and the link if you want to donate through world vision international um, or in reality you can donate through any other charity of your choice there's no specific requirement to donate through this charity this is just one of the biggest ones ones in the world that i've selected through my research it has I've done the due diligence on this on, on this charity, and it's uh, it's legit. So um, the most amount of your donation will actually uh, make its way to the people in need. Now, after this workshop, there will be nine other uh, workshops. Hi, Hekmat. Thank you for commenting uh, from LinkedIn. After this workshop, there will be nine more workshops, and there are three ways to watch it. Uh, you can watch it on the charity.riskawarenessweek.com website. You can watch it on the Risk Academy channel and uh, you can scan those uh, QR codes to go to the destinations. Uh, or you can watch it in uh, LinkedIn. I will be broadcasting every single session today in LinkedIn. So that's a little bit of administration. Um, I, we have an amazing lineup of speakers, risk management to speakers, talking about integrating risk analysis, quantitative risk analysis into decision making. And uh, I, I'm very excited. Uh, I think there's a lot of knowledge. Hi, Mohammed. Thank you for commenting. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge that we kind of jam packed into this one uh, day. By the way, if you're not able to watch this live, these three links, thanks here, sorry. Uh, these three links are also working for replays. All workshops will be available as replays forever. So you can, you'll be able to watch the replays on the website, conference website, registration is free, obviously. You'll be able to watch replays on the Risk Academy YouTube channel. By the way, if you haven't subscribed, you know, please subscribe. Uh, we are, I think, just a few hundreds of 10,000 subscribers. And obviously, you'll be able to watch it in uh, LinkedIn as well. Gert, hi. Uh, lovely to see you. Haven't seen you in ages. So the topic of my workshop today is future trends. Every, every year, I try and uh, uh, pull together three to four themes uh, ideas that I think will um, structure the uh, risk management profession going uh, forward. Mohsen, hi. And uh, by the way, I see Snezhana, Andrew, Gosia. Uh, thank you. I see you commenting in the tech support window. Please comment in the comment section below, um, below uh, the video instead. Don't send it to tech support because 
you know, uh, I'll only be able to respond to it much later. Okay, so this year I pulled together four themes which I think will reshape risk management in non-financial services. Um, I have to make that caveat because risk management in financial services is a slightly different beast in the coming years. So trend number one, and I, I think this is a big one. Decision makers are finally starting to asking different questions and uh, uh, more interesting questions, more thoughtful uh, thoughtful questions. The expectations from the decision makers towards risk management is changing based on what I've seen as the chief risk officer of one of the largest fertilizer companies in the past and then uh, head of operational investment uh, risk and insurance at a large holding company. And uh, uh, the expectations are changing. Alina, hi. Thank you for commenting. Um, So what, what I what I have been observing is that uh, instead of just understanding what are the top risks, which was kind of the traditional conversation for the last, you know, God knows how many decades, the conversation is shifting towards the probability of achieving objectives, um, the upside and downside of decisions, the chances of positive cash flow. Uh, expected rates of return, NPV positive, and so on. Um, expectation is changing towards understanding how does risk, not as a single unit, but as an aggregate, impact something that is meaningful to business. KPIs, objectives, revenue targets, covenants, um, EBITDA, and literally any other meaningful production or financial or, or financial target. For non-financials, it's it, it's kind of the same. You know, you have charity objectives, um, you have funding objectives, and risks affect all of these things. And so the conversation is shifting from just tell us what the you know top three risks are to tell us how these risks and others affect something that is meaningful to the decision makers. Is this a good project or a bad project? Should this project be done this year or next year, given the uncertainty surrounding some of the assumptions that go into the decision making? Faisal, hi. Um, haven't seen you in ages too. And uh, by the way, since this is uh, live, you know, in the comments, ask... Uh, uh, ask questions uh, or ask maybe contribute some of the questions that decision makers are beginning to ask you and uh, some of the new or kind of more interesting questions because uh, what I'm trying to get at is some of those questions, you know, for example, what's the aggregate risk? How are risks correlated? Which assumptions are uh, more volatile? How much do we need to budget for expected losses? How much capital do we need to reserve for unexpected losses? Can we ensure or hedge the tail of the distribution? All of these questions have very simple answers in the risk management tool world. Once you quantify the loss distribution or the aggregate distribution of the risks related to a particular decision or a particular KPI, um, you can answer those questions. Shirat, hi. Um, we can answer those questions, but those questions are impossible to answer with colors. Uh, for example, knowing that you have uh, five high risks does not bring you an inch closer to answering any of those questions. Just the fact that there are multiple significant risks um, is not really helping you to have that communication conversation with the decision makers. So one of the biggest trends that I'm seeing is that the expectations towards risk management, and this is just kind of risk management for the sake of risk management, uh, the expectation towards risk management is changing towards a much more in-depth, uh, insightful, quantitative look at, uh, at risk. Without being able to quantify risk exposure, aggregate risk exposure for a particular decision or an objective or business overall, um, it would be impossible to answer those questions. Luckily, we have all the methodologies to do that. Uh, we just kind of need to start upgrading the methodologies that are used within 
within uh, within the business. So this is trend number one: the expectation towards how risks are identified, aggregated, quantified is changing. Nobody, well, I shouldn't say nobody because you know there are obviously a large variety of organizations on the planet and they all have different maturities and the decision makers have different maturities. Um, but the uh, conversations that I've been having over the last three years have significantly shifted towards quantitative look at risk. And just saying that these are top 10 risks and this is how they mitigate it is no longer accepted as good enough. It's no longer accepted as sufficient work, su sufficient value that risk management can deliver. More value is expected from, uh, from the risk management unit. Mohammed, thank you very much for uh, for your comment. So, second trend. So, the first trend was the expectation towards risk management is changing. Now, the second trend that I'm seeing, which I, I find personally, I find much more exciting, is that business processes are changing faster than the risk management does. So. People in procurement, in finance, in treasury, in investment, in strategic decision, in, st in strategy, in uh, uh, credit, in sales, in logistics, uh, and insurance are evolving and expecting more value from risk management. For example, I've had, you know, I've listed only the cases where I've, uh, I've actually done some interesting work with uh, the other departments in the company. Uh, for example, uh, procurement now moves towards uh, blender models where uh, you can actually break down a, a truck, for example. You can actually break down a truck into components into underlying um, market uh, indices to describe that truck. So, tr so you know, the easy example wa it was uh, tires for the truck. For example, tire is a unit. Now, that unit is actually the price for that tire is actually linked to a formula. It's 30% uh, steel, 20% uh, rubber and 50% oil. Uh, and so procurement is actually thinking about, well, how can we decompose? How, we, how can we break down each of the units that we are buying into the underlying macro parameters? And can we then, by looking at the volatility of those underlying macro parameters, can we then estimate what's the fair price of that unit? And can we then negotiate and re renegotiate with the suppliers on how much we should be charged for for those services. That's one example. Another example was accreditation. When you uh, automating the accreditation process for new vendors, you can actually build a risk model, which is exactly what we've done. You can build a risk model that checks for sanctions, compliance issues, taxation issues, uh, liquidity issues, and uh, any other government uh, you know, related blacklisting and any other uh, any other compliance uh, compliance issues now what was surprising to me is that the predictive power of that risk model is actually much more limited than i would have hoped uh, so we we built we ended up building a three stage risk analysis methodology for the procurement uh, first you do kind of a a quick uh, uh, risk assessment. All of this is automated through a risk model, uh, risk scoring model. Uh, quick risk assessment to identify any deal breakers like taxation issues or fraud or bankruptcy issues or compliance. And that those are all red flags, no goes. And then uh, we, we were in the process of building the methodology for the second layer of risk analysis where you're actually trying to understand well, what's the uh, environmental risks associated with the supplier, what are the safety risks associated with the supplier, what are the logistical risks associated with the supplier. And then the third element 
was what we called risk-based pricing. You get two tenders, you get two proposals from different companies, and they're offering different prices and different combinations of services. Somebody is prepared to uh, build the equipment together and deliver the full equipment. Somebody is uh, um, uh, somebody is uh, uh, prepared to. Uh, deliver parts and you have to collect and assemble the equipment uh, equipment yourself. So to compare those two proposals, you have to come up with a kind of risk adjustment methodology to compare apples to apples. So these are just three examples of how businesses, business processes have evolved so far advanced that they require stochastic risk analysis because whether you build a blender model or whether you build an accreditation risk model or whether you build a risk model for the um, uh, logistical, uh, environmental safety, production, uh, production risk, all of those competencies are available in the risk department and they are not available in the procurement department. Uh, although we had uh, some very strong quants in the procurement department as well. So other businesses, what I'm observing, the trend that I'm observing, other business units have activities and tasks that require in-depth risk analysis, probability management, decision science, and neuroscience knowledge. And a you know, group of knowledge, uh, I don't know if I can, yeah, I don't know if, if it's a thing, if I can say that group of knowledge, uh, a, a group of subjects that are usually concentrated within the risk uh, within the risk team. Same with logistics. Um, it's one. It, you know, it's it's relatively easy to build a logistical uh, model saying a ship comes into the port, it unloads, it, the, it, then uh, uh, the goods are stored in the storage, transferred into the storage. Uh, uh, but the the reality is that each of those steps in the process is stochastic because there could be weather. There could be previous um, ship issues that is hasn't left, so the new ship cannot come in. There could be issues with the storage. There could be issues with the product itself. Uh, all of those components of a logistical model are volatile. They are at risk. And so building a logistical model may be relatively straightforward, but building a stochastic uh, logistical model is much more complicated. And again, this is something that the risk team can potentially support unless the logistical team has their own competencies to do that. Um, and it goes for, uh, for, for everything. Accounts receivables, um, risk managers can help with quantifying credit var, um, insurance, uh, that's just you know, that, that's just kind of the perfect opportunity for risk quantification because I was responsible for reinsurance uh, at the company where I used to work. And what we've discovered is that insurance products, the way they are priced in the market, and we've pilot tested it across Latin America, Europe, US, uh, and Asian markets. And it's pretty much the same every time. Insurance products are mispriced significantly. An average company on the planet is overpaying for their insurance double or triple the fair value of that product. And we were able to derive that because we actually quantified the risks every time we wanted to insure them. So we knew our loss exceedance curve and we knew what the expected losses were. We knew what the unexpected losses were. We knew what was in it, what scenarios were sitting in the fail, in the fat tail of the distribution. And we were able to renegotiate our insurance portfolio and ended up saving it by uh, reducing the cost of insurance by 40% uh, without increasing deductibles or reducing limits. In most cases, we actually improved the quality of coverage, we actually increased limits because we wanted to uh, ensure the full risk exposure and not just historical part of the risk exposure. Uh, and 40% saving in the cost of insurance, uh, that's a lot of money for a a large global corporation. It was um, millions and millions of dollars. Later today, we, um, we're gonna have a session with Graham Keith and David Vose, and we're gonna talk about how can a risk manager 
measure his department's performance and prove that uh, the team is actually adding value to the company. And I'll share a few examples, a uh, few examples of what I've done there. So second theme is the business is evolving so far, so fast that there is now a great demand for stochastic risk analysis. It's not called risk management, but it's just it's an application of risk analysis to important business planning, business uh, decision making. Um, you know, for example, in insurance, you know, what's the, what should be the deductible? Uh, what should be the limit? Uh, what's the fair price for the premium? All of these things are quantifiable. They're calculatable. You don't have to guess which deductible is better or worse. You can actually determine with a certain confidence interval that one deductible is better than the other. You don't have to guess. And, and that's um, that's a big part of, I think, of value coming from risk management is that you don't have to guess. You can, um, Andrew, hi, thank you for commenting. Yes, I can see your comment, uh, Andrew. Ha, ha. Harter? Harter, yes, I saw that. Uh, so thank you. You can ask questions. Continue asking questions and uh, making comments. So uh, another workshop that I uh, highly recommend is uh, um, at 5 p.m. European time, David Vos is going to talk about the shift from the traditional questions that were asked of risk management to the new paradigm that I, I mentioned here. So do catch his workshop uh, as well. And I'll try and kind of make a link to every single workshop uh, that uh, we have planned today. So first theme, risk management is changing. It's no longer good enough to just say which risks are high and uh, who's mitigating them how. Uh, we need to be able to show numbers so that those numbers can be used for further planning, decision-making, budgeting, and uh, a covenants, you know, dialogue with rating agencies and banks. Um, yes, here, hi. The second theme is that the business is now wanting more from risk management. Uh, logistical departments have tasks, have problems that could only be solved using stochastic approach. Deterministically, the solution would be suboptimal. And just how suboptimal? Uh, catch two workshops uh, where I talk to Sam Savage. That's the next session. And another session at 4 p.m. European. Uh, Zaid, hi. Uh, 4 p.m. European, uh, where Sam Savage shows a demonstration on how to turn even your expert opinions into um, I I into a distribution, into something quantifiable. Um, so third theme. But before I get into that, uh, let me uh, let me quickly address the insurance question. Uh, you, you would have thought that actuaries do the uh, pricing on the insurance products. Um, okay, well, that's, uh, I mean, that's, uh, that, that's emotional. Uh, you know, system one comment, please, please try and rephrase that into something that is actually uh, practical. So um, there is an assumption that actuaries do quantification. Uh, of uh, insurance policies. And the reality is, uh, is very different. So the reality is actuaries do a lot of quantification on retail lines of insurance. On corporate lines of insurance, actuaries have models. They have some models. I've seen those models. They are embarrassing. They're kindergarten models. Uh, and we built we built better quantification models than actuaries do within uh, the insurance companies and reinsurance companies for uh, the um, uh, for the corporate lines. Uh, hugest problem is with liability lines, D and O, product liability, third party liability. Um, 
environmental liability. These are some of the most mispriced policies uh, on the planet. I, I mean, cyber risk policy, it's just embarrassing how they're priced. Uh, if you actually looked at the math that sits uh, behind the models. And so one thing is underwriters uh, telling the fair, supposedly fair price. And that, that price is not fair because it's based on um, weak models, to put it mildly. But then there's the underwriter who sits on top of that, who then makes a judgment on how to use that recommendation from the underwriter, because uh, from the actuary, sorry, because underwriters actually price the policies. And that's where there's a huge gap between reality and uh, uh, underwriters' um, uh, underwriters' opinion of the fair value of the risk. Now, you actually don't have to believe me because uh, Daniel Kahneman wrote a book recently called Noise, and the whole second chapter is dedicated to his research into the underwriters of one of the biggest insurance companies on the planet, how they misprice risk completely. By the way, completely disregarding the recommendations that actuaries give them. Uh, so, um, yes, it's a huge issue. Insurance policies are mispriced by a mile. The fair price of insurance products should be significantly different. Um, it could go either way. Sometimes they're underpriced. For example, uh, well, actually, yeah, I, I've, I, I have never seen an underpriced insurance product. It's always double or triple the fair value. Uh, sometimes it's seven times the fair value, uh, which, is, um, uh, which is just, uh, in my mind, is absolutely horrible. Gert, what is that data power city? Uh, but you're absolutely right. That data availability is super important. And that's why we spend, uh, and I'm not exaggerating, we spent months collecting the data from uh, underwriters, uh, reinsurance companies, uh, brokers, industry statistics, including our personal data, so we can build a better risk profile uh, than an insurance company can build. And uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of work. And I was, uh, um, yeah, 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 exactly. Having too little data is a problem. And it is a huge problem for liability lines. Uh, it's uh, not a problem at all for cargo, charters uh, and uh, charters liability, yes, still a problem and uh, property damage, business interruption, uh, less of a problem as well. Um, what, what's the uh, HAL? Uh, yeah, I think that's the English uh, English word for uh, insurance. HAL, HAL also less of an issue. Um, uh, th thanks, Julian. Um, I, I'm sure uh, I, I'm sure there are you know, many reasons why the insurance policies are uh, I, I mispriced, and uh, that's. I, th I think that's a topic for a very wonderful, uh, very wonderful separate workshop that I'm sure I will do for the October Full Risk Awareness Week. Um, the uh, you know we've uh, it was it, it it was a comment that we had last week. Um, there's uh, you know you should probably add like 40 or 60 percent on top of the fair your, your expected losses to calculate the fair price for the policy, um, and that should be fine. But when you add 750 percent on top of the fair price, and you try and justify that with uh, solvency requirements, that's not really true. That's just bad, bad uh, product pricing. Um, somebody from LinkedIn is asking why uncertainty modeling is not quantitative risk modeling. Uh, I don't understand the question because uh, in my mind, it's the same thing. Uh, thanks, Aid, for your comment. Okay, now let me, and that that kind of, even though we digested a little bit, um, they, they digressed. I think that's the word. I, I keep forgetting English words. Um, it does bring us nicely to the third theme because the third theme that I'm observing is that 
I, I think risk management is going to break up into two units. I think the future trend of risk management is to break up into two separate groups. One group will become highly specialized mathematical and they will be the probability distribution generators. These are the people that convert data into probability distributions and they become the custodians for those distributions. They become the data keepers, um, you know, the probability officers. Uh, they generate the inputs, the assumptions that are then used by the rest of the organization. And don't miss Sam Savage's sessions where he will expand on that very topic. I mean, this is something, uh, it's, it's a little bit embarrassing to call it a future trend because this is something Sam and I have been talking. I mean, Sam has been talking. He's, he's the brain behind it. I was kind of just there online uh, asking questions. This is what we've been talking for the last three years. Risk Awareness Week 19, Risk Awareness Week 20, Risk Awareness Week 21, 2021. Um, so it's, it's hardly a new thing, but I think we're much closer. We're closer every year. We're closer and closer to that, uh, uh, that conversation where decision making, um, decision making is uh, historically deterministic. Uh, business plans are based on single point estimates. Budgets are based on single point estimates. Investment valuations are based on single point estimates. The world, the business world has been uh, deterministic for too long. We've been ignoring uncertainty. We've been ignoring volatility for way too uh, long. And I think the future of decision making and the future of risk management as the result is stochastic. I think because the world is stochastic, we have really no much choice than to become stochastic to have an to have a chance to be able to capture that world in our planning, budgeting, forecasting and decision making. Uh, however, Everything that I've discussed, you know, what we've done for insurance, what we've done for logistical teams, what we've done for procurement teams, um, what we've done for market risk, credit risk, uh, how we've modeled operational risk and how we've modeled operational risk through um, uh, data on electricity usage, um, uh, maintenance uh, usage, environmental fines and uh, quality. Um, uh, qu quality uh, recalls, how we model that distribution. All of that requires pretty advanced mathematics. And uh, I, I think my third biggest trend is that if you're not you know, a mathematical genius, I'm not, for example, but I, I hire mathematical geniuses. Um, if you're not a mathematical genius, genius uh, to be able to build a um, splice distribution for cargo insurance, for example, where you have uh, log normal on the body of the distribution and general Pareto on the fat tail distribution. Uh, if, you, if, if those words mean nothing to you, then it, there is a very small probability that you will be able to upskill to a degree where you can build those models. But the reason, and I think the good news is you don't have to. Risk management in my you know, view of the world will split into two and there will be people that build distributions and there will be people that help integrate those distributions into the day-to-day -day operations because any NPV financial model, any uh, insurance submission, any uh, business plan or budget or forecast, they can be significantly improved by adding an element of volatility, by adding this stochastic, uh, stochastic uh, element to it. And uh, so you know, don't despair. Uh, hire good quants in your risk team. You need at least one. Every risk team needs at least one. And then uh, the rest of the department can focus on 
taking the distributions and putting it into different business processes. So don't miss Sam Savage's session on uh, how to do that because uh, building and storing probability distributions is now super easy. It's this much code, like this much text can actually store a full distribution of uh, a um, your cargo insurance, for example, or your credit losses, or the volatility of the price for the products that you sell if they're commodity products, and, and so on. Uh, we actually have the technology to be able to do all of that uh, quite e easily. So I, I think that's the uh, third uh, point uh, that I wanted to to discuss. Now I see I see a comment about uh, somebody being uh, wanting to discuss insurance policy matters uh, as I prepare for the October events. I don't see um, the name from the LinkedIn user because, I don't know, because you probably didn't click something um, to, to show your name. Um, so please comment in the, in the new comment, who, who are you? <laughs> who, who, who do I want to talk to? Um, Gert, thank you for that comment. There's, uh, there's a, a scientific school of thought that looks at uncertainty uh, from a different perspective from pro probability theory. Uh, uh, you know, please share. Uh, please share the, um, the, the, the name so we can, uh, we, we can uh, research it. I mean, I'm, I'm always interested in finding new information. Um, another LinkedIn user is saying uh, quantitative risk analysis only relying on probability estimates is less meaningful without considering the defenses in places. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's a real argument because I cannot think of a QRA analysis that would ignore uh, controls in place. I, I, I think it's a made up argument uh, because when you build when you build a model, when you build a stochastic decision tree, or when you build a uh, a bow tie, a stochastic bow tie. By the way, don't miss uh, David Vos session at 5 p.m. Uh, European time, um, where he actually shows how to build a stochastic bow tie because bow tie bow ties and decision trees uh, and influence diagrams are the three probably most common and most useful techniques for building the model on top of which you can add you know, probability and uh, simulations. Uh, by the way, every single page has a QR code. Um, the whole session and everything this day is free. And the reason why I've made it free is because I didn't want to become an intermediary between you and the charity, so I, you know, no commissions, and because uh, every every transaction comes with some sort of commission, so no no commissions. There's a direct route, and, and so uh, you don't have to donate now. But after the end of the day, just make a judgment on the value that you've received from the session, and how much you would have normally paid for a conference like this, and uh, donate some of that to the charity. Any charity or the one that I've uh, uh, put on every slide. Scan the QR code and or just go to wvi.org, um, World Vision International. OK, um, any other questions, comments or thoughts? I mean, the, the, the this last third theme, that, that surely should be quite controversial. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because I, I think risk department will split into two. Uh, some people will become kind of, you know, in the basement of Pentagon, like there are people right now in the basement of Pentagon doing exactly that. Um, they will be building distributions and they um, will be storing, cleaning the data, collecting the data, updating the distributions. And then the rest of the team will just go around kind of offering this product to every single 
um, every single department saying we can make your maintenance budget better by adding uncertainty and here are the loss distributions for that uh, or we can make your credit scoring decisions better and um, upfront your, your bed we can reduce uh, your bed receivables by adding uncertainty to your uh, sales process and so on and so on and so on there are so many opportunities to make business processes better by integrating risk analysis and an example of that you will be able to see at 2 p.m european time uh, in the workshop run by benoit who will talk about quantifying reputational risk. Uh, I mean, something very, very much relevant uh, right now. And uh, um, he chose this topic of um, quantifying the reputational risk because it's one of those intangible ones where people always find excuses why nothing can be done. And he's showing you, uh, including the code on how he quantifies um, I can't remember what he's using, he will be using R or Python, um, quantifying uh, even the most obscure risks that are normally just phrased under this umbrella called reputational risk. Uh, Gert, thank you very much for, uh, for, for the comment. Okay, and the final, final uh, uh, trend that I've been observing. And this is uh, everything I, I, I talked about today. This is something that I've lived through for the last three years. And so the final trend that I'm observing is that risk managers will have to own model risk. Model risk is basically when you build a model to say we can quantify a risk. And uh, there is a risk that the model that you build to quantify risk has errors. And so you quantify the risk, but you quantify it incorrectly. And that is called model risk. Uh, model risk is, means that you've built a methodology, but the methodology is wrong and it gives wrong conclusions. For example, it says something is high risk, in reality it isn't. Or it says something is not a high risk, but in reality it is. It would say you need to budget two million for uh, uh, to to cover expected losses from these clients or these equipment. Uh, but in fact, the every year the losses are significantly greater, so you miscalculated it. So that's what model risk is, and I think risk managers, uh, just like I was, will be expected and will be responsible, and their bonuses will be linked to the quality of the models uh, that they built. And uh, they will be required to backtest everything. And this is something that uh, um, uh, that is uh, uh, not used commonly enough in non-financial sector. Uh, backtesting everything is a must, uh, a must thing. Uh, a LinkedIn user is, is saying, is model risk the same as epistemic uh, uncertainty? Uh, I don't know. I keep forgetting what epistemic uncertainty means in English. So if you use plain language, please, uh, then I can maybe answer your question better. I mean, every time, because I don't know, Glenn, is it you? Because Glenn always writes about uh, epistemic uncertainty. And every time I Google it and I go, oh, okay, obviously, now, now I get it. And, and then I forget. So I, I forgot. I still don't remember what epistemic uncertainty is. Um, the the English I the the English uh, um, definition. I don't remember what the word epistemic means. Um, uh, but I just from kind of my recollection, I think model risk is uh, is something different. Uh, okay, so one of the biggest trends that I'm seeing, I think risk managers will have to put skin in the game and will be responsible for the models that they produce. Uh, 
Now that goes for all the models that they produce. Building a heat map is also a model because you've chosen the three by three or five by five, you've chosen the grades, you said it's one to five or five to one, you've put some monetary or probabilities there. That, that is also a model. And I think one of the biggest trends that I'm seeing is that risk managers will be responsible for the products of those models. So what this means is that at some stage, an internal auditor will come in and say, okay, you've been doing a heat map for your quarterly risk reporting for the last God knows how many years. Let's backtest that, um, that, um, let, let's backtest how that heat map actually helped us to allocate resources and uh, prioritize our risks. Let's see if we can match the actual financial performance of the company to the risks identified as significant in the heat map. Now, I have bad news for you because a number of scientists have already done that research and they found that the model risk associated with using heat maps is so significant, then you're better off not doing any risk analysis at all because the methodology that is used for different heat maps misjudges the risk and misprioritizes the risk so much. Uh, and in fact, David Vos later today will show you some examples on how unreliable any risk matrix on the planet uh, or on the planet is. So again, you're more than welcome to continue using heat maps. Um, just keep in mind that at one stage you'll have to backtest it and don't be surprised or at least don't look surprised when it turns out that it was worse than a horoscope. It had the same predictive power of a horoscope and horoscopes of course are nonsense. Um, so model risk is, um, is super important. And the, the, the other trend that I'm, uh, I expect and I hope, and you can be certain I'll do my part to make sure this does happen. Um, I expect huge liability claims against consultants and risk management associations who were so shamelessly and still are shamelessly promoting risk management one to their clients and members um, and all the methodologies that they publish. I mean, your COSO um, is by, has done by far the most damage as well as uh, Global Institute of Internal Auditors. Uh, the amount of damage that they've done to the risk profession and to the business in general is just staggering. It's absolutely criminal. Uh, obviously not as criminal as a war because uh, there's nothing worse on the planet than a war. Um, but you know, you get my point. And by the way, don't forget to donate. Now, uh, let me quickly answer uh, some of the questions. Uh, would further focus and drive towards quantitative risk management, isolate risk management department and make it accessible to selected few in the organization? Okay, so this is an important um, question which has two parts. Uh, the, there's the kind of the simple, the simple answer is uh, any risk management that is not quantitative is not risk management to begin with. So there's no point kind of pretending, uh, pretending otherwise. Um, you know, building horoscopes or um, uh, you know, building colorful heat maps is not risk management. Uh, so you know, we have to start with risk management is quantitative in its original design. It was kind of dumbed down for marketing purposes by big four and sold as a competency that can be done by anyone, but that's just, that's just marketing, that's not real. Uh, and then the second kind of more real part of the question is, uh, I think, as I said in the third theme, third theme here is that risk management will split into two. There will be hardcore quants who build the distributions and there will be kind of qualitative people who understand the distributions enough to go and sell uh, because you know, building a distribution is half the job. The second part of the job is to convince the logistical department or the head of strategy or head of investments 
to use the distributions consistently and to trust in those distributions, trust in the, in the back tests. And uh, somebody needs to do the sales pitch. Somebody needs to do the sales job. So I think the risk management team will split into two, the quants and the sales people who will be going around saying, we can make your logistical decisions better. We can make your maintenance decisions better by integrating these uncertainties into uh, the business process. So I hope I answered that question. Um, okay, epistemic uncertainty is associated with the uh, part of the distribution. Uh, it's basically just kind of random error that sits in every uh, distribution. Um, yes, there is that. There is that. So yes, that that I guess could be described as model risk. Uh, but more more than that is when we build risk models, we make a lot of decisions uh, on which direction to take. You know, for example, you could use, uh, you know, random walk or you can use a bootstrap. That's a decision for the risk manager to make. You can use a bootstrap on five, five previous years or 10 previous years or 20 previous years. Uh, you can uh, exclude or include outliers. There are a lot of methodological decisions for the risk professional to make and uh, um, making those decisions making those choices uh, incorrectly is uh, um, is a model risk for example he's he's the easiest one so um, in construction industry uh, quantitative risk analysis is uh, more it's it's still far from being mature, but it's more common than in other uh, business processes. So, for example, cost at risk and schedule at risk are relatively common things. Uh, but there's the model risk because you know what is the most traditional, most common approach to quantify schedule and budget risk for large construction projects? They use triangular distributions uh, on different jobs. They say, OK, there is some volatility around how quickly we can do this task in the work breakdown structure. So they put a triangular distribution on top of that. And triangular distribution is by far the most common distribution used in construction industry. Now, here's the model risk. Triangular distribution is actually a bad choice. Um, not, not only that each risk should have its own distribution nature and a metalog would be much more appropriate. Sam Savage is going to talk about metalogs uh, uh, today. But even using a Perth distribution or a modified Perth distribution would be so much better. Uh, so that's the type of, uh, uh, of model risk that we're talking about. Risk managers have a lot of decisions to make in how they build risk models. And uh, um, it's uh, it, it's it's not it's not easy because there's no right answer most of the time. It's all kind of trial and error, building a model, back testing it, uh, and constantly validating and updating the model. Um, Zaid said uh, the problem with our risk community that we build jargon that nobody understands except ourselves. Um, I mean, maybe. Uh, to be honest, that's the least of our problems. The much bigger problem is that uh, you know 99% of the risk community don't understand the basic math behind risk. Um, yeah, I, I've uh, I wrote an article. What is risk? Uh, and risk is basically either a product of distributions, a discrete distribution, uh, or um, a, a continuous distribution as volatility around uh, around an assumption. Uh, and you know, even that basic notion. That's like you know kindergarten math to understand the nature of risk. Uh, even that is, for some reason, not common knowledge. So we have uh, a, a long distance to go as the risk community. Uh, but this is why we've created Risk Awareness Week. And by the way, uh, the, you know, um, th this is this is a feeling that I had uh, when I was building a program for today uh, that the workshops that we did in 2019. So that was three years ago. They're still as relevant as today. By the way, Risk Awareness Week 2019 is completely free. 
now. So you can go to 2019.riskawarenessweek.com and watch all the workshops. They're still as relevant as they were three years ago. We haven't progressed enough as the uh, as the risk community. All right. So I I shared everything I wanted to share. Please remember to donate. Let me quickly run you, you through the remaining workshops for today. Next, uh, Sam Savage uh, will talk about this move towards making the world stochastic. The world is already stochastic and we need to make our business practices, business decision making stochastic. And he's showing a very simple way how to do it. Next, Doug Hubbard um, is going to share some of the latest developments in consolidating expert opinions. How can you convert uh, opinions, human opinions, into quantifiable data that you can use for risk uh, risk modeling. Next, uh, I'm going to talk with uh, Graham Keith and David Vose uh, about how to measure risk manager's performance. How can you determine if the risk team is adding value to the business or not? Then Hans Liso will talk about effective risk reporting and why you should never have a risk report as a corporation if you're not in financial services, where the regulators require you to submit certain reports on a regular basis. Um, how do you integrate information about risk into existing performance reporting, into existing financial reporting? That will be the theme for, here, for Hans's conversation. Uh, Benoit Ladisser uh, will talk about, will give you kind of an example on how can you apply everything that was discussed during the day to even the most obscure risks like reputation. And he will hopefully dispel the myth that you cannot quantify certain risks. You can quantify any risk on the planet. Um, and I know that because I've quantified so many intangible risks and how we do that it's always a decision tree plus some stochastic monte carlo then david lindstad will talk about the specter of resilience he will talk about the future of resilience and right now we are in the kind of in the eye of the storm um, pandemic over not over war in the middle of europe um, logistical routes supply chains, uh, sales, financial transactions, uh, cost of capital inflation, all of that is going up in flames and is affecting a lot of businesses in the world. So uh, do watch David's session on how to prepare and how to position your organization to survive this crisis and the next crisis. Then Sam Savage will do a second session uh, showing a very simple online tool how can you how you can take any set of data including opinions remember david uh, the doug hubbard session on how to improve the opinions that you collect from people but you can take those improved or calibrated opinions and you put it in a simple calculator that gives you the distribution the technical side of creating risk data has been simplified as much as possible and it's now accessible to majority of the people. Um, I highly recommend you using it. Then David Vose will talk about some of the limitations on uh, of heat maps and traditional approach to risk analysis, qualitative risk analysis, and will show you how to very easily convert from a heat map to a stochastic bow tie. And bow tie being one of the most common tools uh, applied. And then Trent Russell uh, will finish the day with some nice examples on illustration, the data, and communicating the data um, to the decision makers. Once you've done all of your risk analysis and you're happy that the math is accurate and you're comfortable that the back tests have been passed, um, you still have a huge task of communicating that to the decision makers so that they can use it for 
planning and budgeting purposes. And uh, Trent pulled together a few very practical examples to show how to better communicate uh, data to decision makers. Uh, Mohammed is asking a very good question. Is there, are there any sessions on project risk assessment and approach to it? Uh, of course, yes. The, uh, so, so the easiest, the easiest example is go to 2020, uh, no, go to 2021.riskawarenessweek.com and all of Thursday, that there are like five or six sessions all dedicated to project risk management. Uh, last year, during the Risk Awareness Week, a full day, it was Thursday, a full day was dedicated to just project risk management. And when I say project risk management, I don't mean the rubbish that is written in PM Book and the nonsense that is published by PMI. I'm talking about proper quantitative project risk analysis based on some of the best practices published by AACE. So there is, a, there is a lot of information on project risk management, and I hope you find it of value. Now, the next session is beginning already. Thank you very much, and I'll see you soon.